What, Jane Austen's a man? Of course. A huge Yorkshireman with a beard like a rhododendron. <laughs> Welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we're counting down our picks for the top ten British sitcoms of the 80s. Before we begin, we publish new content every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. For this list, we'll be ranking our favourite situation comedies that enjoyed the lion's share of their success throughout the 1980s. Did we leave any out? Let us know in the comments. Number 10, Red. I'm doing this for her, Billy. You and I don't really need to be married. Let's face it, we could wake up in the morning and feel as far apart as a bow-legged man's knees. <coughs> no, this sitcom wasn't about the beloved carbohydrate with which so many of us overindulge but rather bread, as in money, moolah, greenbacks. Here, the focus is on the Boswell family, a working-class brood from Liverpool who are always trying to make ends meet, including through some, let's say, less-than-scrupulous means. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? I'm as innocent as a baby thrush. Red didn't shy away from presenting its protagonists as both complex and flawed, with the Boswell patriarch Freddy shamelessly keeping a mistress. Meanwhile, the Boswell kids also indulge in some bad behaviour, including, but not limited to, tax fraud, and Bread kept audiences engaged by allowing its storylines to run week to week, as opposed to being tight and self-contained. Don't use those words. I don't like those words. Number 9. To the Manor Born. That's uh, £5.37 in all. Shifting gears for a bit, the characters featured in To the Manor Born weren't exactly mirroring the working class sentiment of the Boswells from Bread. Instead, protagonist Audrey Forbes Hamilton comes from money. A lot of money, in fact. Although, the plot of the show involves Hamilton being widowed and having to sell her lavish estate. Mr. Devere? Oh well. Mine, I think. She moves into a small house on the property, however, and enjoys a will-they-won't-they they relationship with its new owner. The romantic subplots of To the Manor Born are fun, while Hamilton's fall from financial grace is a great way to kickstart what was a very popular British sitcom hit. Such a lady. <clears throat> to think she has the queen on her mantelpiece. <laughs> Number 8. Keep it in the family. There's been a long history of hit British sitcoms being adapted into equally popular iterations overseas. Three's Company, The Office and Sandford and Son all possess British roots, as does our next pick, Keep It In The Family. This funny and charming British show was adapted in the US as Too Close For Comfort, starring Ted Knight of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. It's agony, blinding agony. Oh, you're a bit better then. <laughs> The OG Keeping in the Family followed a cartoonist, Dudley Rush, who lives with his wife and two daughters, the latter of which occupy the basement level of the family flat. The sitcom played up its light-hearted sexual shenanigans and was unique in its depiction of Dudley and his wife Muriel enjoying a thriving romantic relationship. Can I have a piece now? I'm starved. Certainly not, but you can lick the icing spoon. That's like blowing a kiss to a sex maniac. Quite progressive for the time, really. Number 7. Heidi High Non-British viewers might find themselves at a loss regarding some of the jokes and situations featured within the long-running 80s sitcom Heidi High. Its holiday camp setting was fertile ground for years of great jokes only the Brits will get. I don't want to shave in the same wash basin as Punch has been sitting in all night. You never know what he's been up to. The gags on the show, however, hilarious particularly anything coming from Heidi High breakout character Sue Pollard's Peggy Olerenshaw. Peggy's maid character made for some funny and genuinely sweet moments with the other characters who work at the fictional Maplin's holiday camp, making Heidi High something of a hidden gem on this list for those new to British comedy. Beautiful. <laughs> Number six, yes, Minister, yes, Prime Minister. Care to comment on this shabby deception? Oh. 
That was a bit of a googly, wasn't it, sir? <laughs> the sitcoms Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister weren't the only comedy shows from the 80s that tackled political satire, but it could be argued that they were among the best. This was because of the quality of the writing at hand, a biting wit that allowed both Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister to shine brightly amongst their peers. May I show you some of the paperwork emanating from St Edward's? No, no, Humphrey. No, you may not. Enough is enough. Check them. The shows, by their own admission, didn't take place at the House of Commons, with co-creator Jonathan Lynn explaining to fans via a Q&A that the crux of the show's humour dealt with what went on behind the scenes. In this case, backstage political theatre and intrigue never seemed so funny. I'm not at all happy about my speech for the party conference. It contains absolutely no good news. We couldn't think of any. Number 5. Allo Allo The British have never shied away from shining a comedy light into the heart of darkness. Two of his front teeth were missing. Also, he had a limp. I thought you said you were half asleep. I was. If I had been fully awake, I would have been able to give you a more detailed description. For example, the fact that the beloved Brit sitcom Allo Allo is set during World War II takes the power away from such a dark period of history and attempts to illuminate our memories with the healing power of laughter. The show's setting of a cafe within occupied France could have been executed in a tone-deaf fashion, but Allo Allo instead does the very opposite. Its cast of characters buy into a wide array of European stereotypes, lampooning the English, French, and of course, the Germans. But the madcap humour and bawdy visual sight gags are exaggerated to the point where the mood is never spiteful. I am lost for words to show my love, so please, accept this rose. Instead, Allo Allo manages to ride a delicate line and does so brilliantly. Number 4. The Young Ones The important call, Neil! You've got your complete teacup, aren't you? American kids in the 80s probably didn't know what hit them when MTV decided to air episodes of The Young Ones on their fledgling network. How else could they come to terms with the show's chaotic humour, surreal sight gags and smart, envelope-pushing dialogue? The Young Ones was cartoonishly violent and a vivid portrayal of squalid student life in the midst of Thatcherite Britain. The programme even functioned as a variety show of sorts, presenting musical guests like Madness and Motorhead shoehorned into an episode's narrative with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer. If you like television comedy at its most unhinged, The Young Ones is for you. Number 3. Red Dwarf <laughs> Is that a cigarette you're smoking, Lister? No, it's a chicken. Is Red Dwarf a science fiction show? Yes. Is it a sitcom? Also yes, and a damn good one at that. Red Dwarf practically defines the phrase cult classic, having gained a fan following since debuting back in 1988. Red Dwarf fandom lives on today as well, since the show was unique in its juxtaposing of traditional sitcom tropes into a strange world. For your average layman to comprehend, a stasis leak is a leak, right? In stasis, hence the name A Stasis Leak. <laughs> you don't know, do you, Hop? No, I don't. A world where its lead protagonist is actually the last human in the universe. Again, Red Dwarf takes an inherently dark premise, radiation leaking, killing everyone on board except for a man and his cat, and turns it on its head with the sort of jokes you'd see on a family comedy. After all, they call them cult classics for a reason. Come on, you chicken. Show us your slobbery chops and we'll blow them off. Number two, Only Fools and Horses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, go on, carry on, yeah, yeah. It's not uncommon for sitcoms around the world to influence popular culture for a while in their native country, but Only Fools and Horses was something a bit different. This is because its influence wasn't really a fleeting trend, but something that was passed down from old fans to new fans, creating something that went on to permeate a lot of British slang. Heck, you're probably seeing plonker in your head right now, aren't you? Yeah, you own companies, corporations, conglomerates everywhere. It's horrible. The get-rich-quick exploits of the Trotter brothers thrilled audiences for a decade, launching an appreciation society, spin-offs in dozens of countries and languages, and ten additional years of Christmas specials.
Number one, Blackadder. On a day like today, I feel proud to be a member of the greatest kingdom in the world. And doubtless many other members of the animal kingdom feel the same way. <laughs> it takes a certain kind of sitcom to build up the sort of goodwill that Blackadder has over the decade since it first went off the air back in 1989. Fans today are still discovering its four unique and uniquely hilarious series, each taking place during a different time period. Rowan Atkinson's Edmund Blackadder was truly a television character for the ages, regardless of genre, while the show's poignant finale stands as one of the finest moments of British television, full stop. Jane Austen's a man? Of course. A huge Yorkshireman with a beard like a rhododendron. <laughs> it was a whistle-stop tour of British history, blasting through Elizabeth I, aka Queenie, foppish Prince George's Regency, and of course, the solemn trenches of the First World War. Oh, damn. <laughs> Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Watch Mojo UK and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.